I'm John Fugelsang. This is Viewpoint. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Edward Snowden strikes again. As the G8 summit gets underway, news of a British cyber spy operation on diplomats at the 2009 G20 summit. Another nugget from the 29-year-old alleged NSA leaker who is still nowhere to be found by authorities, but true to his generation and cyber stealth was available for an online chat with readers at The Guardian where he showed no signs of backing down. All I can say right now is the U.S. government is not going to be able to cover this up by jailing or murdering me. Truth is coming. It cannot be stopped. Meanwhile, former President, Vice President rather, Dick Cheney surfaced on Fox News of all places to call Snowden a traitor that might be working with the Chinese. He also thinks Mr. Snowden might have had help inside the NSA. I'm deeply suspicious, obviously, because he went to China. That's, that's not a place where you ordinarily want to go if you're interested in freedom and liberty and so forth. Um, so it raises questions whether or not he had that kind of connection before he did this. The other concern I have is whether or not he had help from inside the agency. But I, um, uh, I am very, very worried uh, that he still has additional information that he hasn't released yet. And we're sure he does. The Chinese say the accusation is completely groundless. And Snowden said today he saw this coming. Uh, in his own words, ask yourself, if I were a Chinese spy, why wouldn't I have flown directly to Beijing? I could be living in a palace petting a phoenix by now. Maybe if you're in a Harry Potter book. But Snowden is definitely having real impact. The Senate Intelligence Committee released information to show the value of the programs saying that 20 terrorist plots were prevented by them and fewer than 300 U.S. phone numbers were actually checked by the NSA in all of last year. Of course, Mr. Snowden says that is bunk. As Americans find themselves debating exactly how much privacy they are willing to give up for the promise of security. Well, joining us now is a man in a unique position to discuss Mr. Snowden's predicament, famed former NSA whistleblower Thomas Drake. Mr. Drake, what a pleasure to have you here this evening. Good evening to you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So uh, your experience was, of course, very different from Edward Snowden's. Uh, for those who don't know, can you tell us what happened when you blew the whistle on what the NSA was doing? Well, I blew the whistle within the system over several years, including serving as a material witness on a number of investigations, including two 9-11 uh, congressional investigations, as well as the Department of Defense Office of Inspector General uh, audit investigation. and revealing massive fraud, waste, and abuse in the billions of dollars. I also blew the whistle on the secret surveillance program, the foundations for the very contours that we're seeing with, the, uh, with Snowden's disclosures. And I also blew the whistle on what critical information NSA had that was not shared that could have prevented 9-11. And of course, uh, can you share any of what that information was uh, that could have prevented 9-11? Critical information regarding Al-Qaeda and associated movements that NSA chose to keep rather than share. Uh, critical reports that were never shared uh, with those who could have taken action. And then later discovering, uh, using extraordinarily innovative uh, system, uh, software system called ThinThread, discovering uh, post-9-11 uh, and pre-9-11 information additional information that was actionable that had never been uh, known by NSA within its own databases. And it's a bit amazing, Mr. Drake, that the same violations of the Fourth Amendment that you uh, called the government out on 10 years ago are, of course, what we're still debating today. And as you know, the president said earlier that the NSA programs are transparent and said, if you're a U.S. person, then NSA is not listening to your phone calls and it's not targeting your emails unless it's getting an individualized court order. Uh, President Obama also made clear he doesn't appreciate the comparisons to Dick Cheney in letting the surveillance continue. Sir, what's your reaction to that? <laughs> the U.S. government is showing a rank hypocrisy in terms of what they're sharing. They're desperate to protect the secret surveillance programs that have now become institutionalized and normalized. We're talking about, you know, under the, what I call the kabuki dance of, and veneer of, of legality. They're asserting that uh, it's all legal, uh, but for a number of years, because I was there when I blew the whistle originally, the, the White House, in collaboration with NSA, chose to deliberately and willfully bypass the Fourth Amendment and uh, violate the uh, FISA at the time, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance uh, Act. Mm -hmm. uh, 
They later pass Enabling Act legislation that essentially ex post facto laws, which is a violation of our justice system, making legal what had been illegal, and then secretly interpreting those laws to further extend what is now the largest suspicionless surveillance system in the world, in the history of mankind. And was that Operation Stellar Wind, sir? Well, Stellar Wind was the original umbrella program that the U.S. government operated in, in the greatest of secrecy. It was, literally was a state secret. It was only whispered in the halls of NSA for those who even had a hint of it. Mm -hmm. And that was a warrantless program. It, it just simply said we need the data, get it, and it started with the telcos. Essentially what we're seeing with the Verizon order, compelling Verizon to turn over 100 million plus phone records to NSA each and every day. Well, they were already doing that after 9-11. So what do you make then of the disclosure over the weekend that those 20 plots around the world were disrupted by these same secret programs, and again that only 300 phone numbers were checked by NSA all of last year? I don't believe anything the government says. They have every reason to cover up the truth just based on the history here over the past almost 12 years. And in fact, I would actually answer that by saying, of all of those plots, what, what was solely, solely interrupted or solely disrupted or solely discovered by virtue of their surveillance program? That's an excellent question, and it's one that I don't hear a lot of journalists asking these days. Are you surprised, sir, that so many Americans are shrugging their shoulders at Snowden's disclosure, saying it is just the cost of security? Well, I don't know if it's so many Americans. You know, there's been several polls, and there are a number of polls that are indicating that the, the Americans are now questioning their own government. There is a thing, a sense of fair play in this country, and I think people are, based on all the disclosures, in fact, we're now beginning to have the real national debate that we've never had s since 9-11. You know, how far do we erode our fundamental rights and freedoms for the sake of security, forsaking the real national security of the, of the United States, which is the grand experiment launched over 220 years ago? Sir, as someone who was an expert in East Germany at the time, the ultimate surveillance state, uh, how much did 9-11 change everything in terms of how we collect intelligence? Well, the mantra was we just need the data. Remember, 9-11 was a fundamental failure of the U.S. government's mandate to provide for the common defense. And so in part, the reaction was, and the fear, the fear that was behind it was we just need everything. Right. And if it means we're going to violate some rights of Americans, so be it. Essentially, we've all become foreigners. That's what's happened. They're really, this distinction of U.S. person, uh, foreign citizen, or foreign national is, is really artificial. Mm -hmm. Well, then why do you think the tech companies are being so secret about their relationship with the NSA? What exactly is the situation there? Well, you know, this is where, this is where the acid of, of secrecy and surveillance are eating the heart out of our democracy and the American experience. They are gagged. Those, those are special orders. Those are special agreements. They cannot acknowledge the nature of those agreements, nor can they provide the details of those agreements. And so they're compelled to deny or, or preclude any conversation about what, what they're actually doing in concert with the government. I mean, this is, it's really unprecedented in this country to have this kind of arrangement in the deepest of secrecy between the U.S. government and very large corporations, essentially the heart of the Internet service providers and the telcos, as well as other data brokers. Again, we haven't seen all the orders. Believe me, what's been disclosed to date is only the tip of the iceberg in terms of these special arrangements. So they cannot actually say that they have these arrangements. And in fact, there's very few people even within those companies that even know about the arrangements, just so that to would, keep it as... That would be the plausible deniability for a program like PRISM. Precisely, which is really having direct access to content from the very servers that are hosted by the same Internet service providers. Fascinating. You worked at Booz Allen, where, of course, Mr. Snowden was an employee. Booz Allen seems analogous to Halliburton in a way. How does it work with the government? I mean, Mike McConnell, the former NSA chief, is, of course, working there now. Well, he's a classic example. He's really an exemplar of the, the revolving door. You know, I, he was originally, well, when I first knew of him, he was the director of NSA for about four years. In fact, he had been the J-2, the, the lead intelligence officer who reports to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, or I actually used to work at the National Military Joint Intelligence Center for a number of years as an intel officer in the Navy. Um, he left, he left, he retired from the government and went to Booz Allen as, as a senior partner. In fact, he was actually on my promotion uh, board when I was... Um, promoted to management level at Booz Allen. 
Okay, well, I want to bring in Jesslyn Radak to join us, sir. Uh, she is from the Government Accountability Project, and she is also your attorney, Thomas Drake. Ms. Radak, welcome back to Viewpoint. It's a pleasure to have you once again on the show. Thank you. Well, now, just to play devil's advocate here, if I may, haven't the Snowden reports about China and tapping foreign leaders done some damage, especially on the eve of the G8 summit where President Obama is dealing with Syria and other high-stakes matters? How do you respond to the people who are saying that at this point, uh, Mr. Snowden really is harming American interests? You know, the information that came out about the summit was nothing new. Big surprise. America's NSA and the British equivalent are spying on allies. The same thing was reported in 2003 and again in 2005. This is not really a surprise to anyone. Um, unfortunately, it just gives further fuel to the fire of examining Mr. Snow and dissecting and trying to deconstruct what his motives are mm -hmm. and who he is. And that, again, is a real distraction from the fact that he has put out extremely damning information, including information that came out last night that I barely saw any attention to today about how it's not just PRISM, but there are four other prime four other programs four programs together mm -hmm. that are doing intelligence gathering both telephonically in terms of metadata and internet in terms of content um, in other words his program was far massive than what he revealed initially um, and you know, again, you know, I don't know if it's getting drowned out by other news or if we have such a short attention span or if it's too much fun to shoot the messenger rather than listen to the message. But and that seems to be the game this week. Yeah. We really need to focus on what he has revealed and the unprecedented level of secrecy for our government engaging in patently illegal activity, no matter what the president or the Congress says. It's not up to the lawbreaker to decide whether or not they've committed a crime. I mean, well, so yeah, that's 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 the big question, and I think that you're going to see a lot of government pushback on that. And while I know that last night's disclosures didn't surprise either of you, do you expect there to be many more disclosures? I mean, this is for both of you. How much more is there to know at this point about what the NSA does? I think there's a lot more. I think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. As I said, um, more than uh, just jokingly, NSA, we wiretap the world. This is a vast, systemic Leviathan surveillance system. And it is, it is huge, and it's far larger than it has ever been acknowledged before, although a number of us have been talking about this for quite some time. It's now just getting out about what at least the, the initial contours of how large this really is. Well, Jessica, uh, Tom, of course, had a cameo in Edward Snowden's chat today on The Guardian. Uh, and, of course, Mr. Drake's name is coming up quite a bit these days. But the question was, if Tom Drake and other whistleblowers uh, you represent influence this path, and Snowden said that citizens with a conscience are not going to ignore wrongdoing simply because they're going to be destroyed for it. So that's pretty inspiring talk, but can we expect to see others come forward? Or is Bradley Manning going to be the ultimate example now of what happens to you if you share this information? Look, I think with Brad, when Bradley Manning came forward and he's gotten the worst treatment, including torture, and that is a conclusion found by the judge that in his unlawful pretrial conditions um, procedure and found by the special repertoire um, that, that he was tortured. So if after seeing what Bradley Manning went through, someone like Snowden is still willing to come forward, that says volumes about the fact that there are people out there who are moral vertebrates, who do have their ethical compass pointed in the right direction and have a clear conscience in this country. I, I've seen more people coming out leaking despite the fact that the government's treatment of leakers grows harsher and harsher and harsher. I think there's almost a revenge effect, a blowback effect by people trying to make information that should be publicly available mm -hmm. free to society in the public interest. Well, consider Remember, I was please. eyewitness to the, I was eyewitness right after 9-11 to my horror, the subversion of our own Constitution.
the idea that I took an oath to support and defend four times in, in my government career. And I could not remain silent. If I remained silent, I would simply have been an accessory to a crime. And so I blew the whistle as loud as I could within the system. I ultimately was unable to prevail. All of the evidence that I gave Congress was suppressed and censored. And so I made a fateful decision, very similar to, to uh, Mr. Snowden. I went to the press in 2006 with, the, with what I knew about the secret surveillance program, what, what NSA had not shared that could have mm -hmm. stopped 9-11, and the massive fraud, waste, and abuse, the billions and billi billions spent. Well, Mr. Drake, it's really a pleasure to meet you and to talk to you as someone who's followed your story over the years. I thank you for your service. We all know this story is not going away. It will only deepen and intensify. We hope to get both of you back as this develops. Thomas Drake and Jessalyn Radak, again, thank you both so much for joining us tonight.